nations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, say that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. As we look at those at this first uh, section of what he shared with them, um, it's where I want to focus here tonight and, and really work to that main thought uh, that I have this evening, verse 24, that none of these things move me. None of these things move me. And uh, that's what I would like to really focus on. Before we get there, though, there's a few other things that stand out to me. In verse number 19, the Apostle Paul talks about his example. He talks about who he was to the Ephesians and uh, to these that he had discipled in the faith. And he tells them of his example. And one of the things that we learn, of course, from the Apostle Paul is that he was a great leader. Uh, he discipled, he trained others. Uh, but he himself was also one who was discipled. And all of us are simultaneously, no doubt, followers and to a certain extent leaders. Now, who we're leaders of and, and how many we are leading varies, obviously, per person and, and uh, which stage you're at in life. Uh, JJ at this point is not so much a leader, but uh, one day uh, he perhaps will be. Uh, but uh, we find the Apostle Paul was a leader, but he was also a follower. One of the things that Paul had mentioned uh, to the uh, church in uh, the book of Ephesians, and I think it was uh, Ephesians chapter 5, perhaps verse number 1, uh, I may be wrong on that, but he said, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Jesus Christ. And boy, that, that's taking on a lot of responsibility to say, follow me, right? Uh, there's a lot of people today that say, follow me, uh, but they're missing the key ingredient that Paul mentioned in that call to others to follow him. And he says, follow me even as I also follow Jesus Christ. Don't follow those who aren't following Jesus Christ, right? And for us, if we find ourselves in a position of leadership, then we've got to still be followers, followers of Jesus Christ, always following his lead. There's none of us that are at the top of the pyramid, so to speak, is there? It's always the Lord. And so Paul here speaks of his example, and he tells them again things that they would have known, uh, the humility of mind, how he saw himself. He, it says that he was serving. Now, Paul, even though he was the leader, wasn't there to be served, but like Christ, he was there as a servant, and he was a servant of the Lord. He also uh, served with, it says, many tears. So that shows us his heart of compassion, a heart of genuine concern for the people in Ephesus. Uh, a broken heart, and uh, one that the Lord uses. And we also find in that verse, in verse number 19, that he endured many temptations. That, in that context, means trials, many tests that he was forced to face in his ministry. And all because of, it says in verse number 19, for the lying in wait of the Jews. He had enemies, he had ad adversaries. But we see in verse 20 what he was able to say, and this is... Uh, as a leader, especially as a, as a church teacher and preacher, uh, so important to be able to say this at the end of your ministry, that he said, I kept, nothing that was, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. And uh, what is it that's most profitable? It's the Word of God. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, uh, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is... What's the next word? Profitable. And so always, uh, for every leader, whether it's uh, in the home as father or mother, whether it's uh, a teacher, whether it's in a group of friends as a leader, always, never, I should say always, but never hold back that which is most profitable. And that's not opinion, that's the Word of God. But we also notice in verse number 21 what he was proclaiming and what his message was. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. Uh, 
What is repentance? Repentance in the Greek, that's metanoia. It speaks of a changed mind, most basic sense of that word, but ultimately has in the concept of it a turn. Uh, But you'll notice that repentance and faith are uh, in... Uh, divisible. You, you cannot have one without the other. A faith without repentance is not uh, a genuine faith, uh, because what are you putting your faith in God to do? If you haven't repented, you're still trusting in yourself. You're still believing in the wrong things. You're still, uh, you haven't believed on the Lord to save you. Uh, if you have repentance but not faith, what have you turned to? Uh, you haven't yet turned to, your, to the Lord. Uh, and as it says in this passage then, he speaks of repentance toward God. A genuine repentance is not me going out and cleaning up my life because the reality is I can't. I can't go clean up my life. I can't put away sin uh, by myself. I have to understand that repentance is to come to an end of myself so I turn to God and put my faith in Him, my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse me and to save me. And and so this was the message of the Apostle Paul. Uh, There's one group that uh, teaches and, and actually had... Uh, them uh, had one that was in our church and had a meeting with them not too long ago, and uh, they teach a hyper dispensationalism. And that hyper dispensationalism, they say that repentance is not for today. That that was a message in a previous dispensation, but Paul is the one that we follow, and Paul didn't preach repentance. Peter and John preach repentance. And I look at this passage and I think all you had to do was turn to Acts chapter twenty, right? What does Paul say his message was? Repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is the message. That's the message that all need to hear. Even Jesus Christ himself in Mark chapter number 1, how does it begin? He says in verse number 15, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. And uh, you can't believe until you have repented. You uh, uh, You can't repent. Uh, without believing. They're the two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. And I hope that we understand that. Um, I use an illustration, and, and most of you have heard this before. Sorry for using the same one, but I can't come up with a better one yet. Uh, and uh, so I like to share this with people who are lost in illustrating faith and repentance and how they work together. But suppose that we were in an airplane and I was the pilot. You'd be in big trouble, right? Because I can't fly. But somehow, imagine, I got this plane up in the sky, and we're sailing, I don't know, 5,000 feet up. Just me and you, sipping on a lemonade, right? Enjoying a beautiful sky. And uh, as we're there, all of a sudden, something goes wrong in that plane. And uh, I say, I better go check out what's going on. So I run to the back of the plane. I come running back up into the cockpit. I've got a parachute on now, and I, I hand one to you. And I say, um, the plane's on fire, you better get out. And I jump. Now at that point, you've got a decision to make, right? This is, by the way, a lot of times how I will witness to somebody. And I'll, I'll ask them, I said, if that was the news that you just received, would you just say, ah, at a more convenient time, I will consider these things? No. You wouldn't sit there and think, well, let me finish my lemonade. Then I'll look into this, right? I say, ah, uh, it's not too bumpy yet. I'm enjoying the ride. I'm just going to keep it. No, you would take action, right? You would take action. Uh, you would say, I better look into this. And if you discover that that plane is on fire, then you would most likely say, I'm getting out too. I can't keep going the same direction I'm going. So then I'll ask him, I say, so what will you do? And knowing that the plane's on fire, will you jump out of the plane and start flapping your arms? No, of course not. Why? Because you understand that in that circumstance, if you stay in the plane, you're dying, and you can't save yourself. You can't fly. If you jump out and start flapping your arms, you're no better off than just staying in the plane, right? One way or another, you're destroyed. So what do you have to do? Say, well, I know what I would do. I'd put on the parachute. And I'd jump out, and I'd pull that cord, and I'll ask them, have you ever parachuted before? I've only had one or two people tell me yes. Mostly they say no. It's like, so you've never done this before, but you're willing to bank your entire life on the promise of that parachute. And I say, yeah, that's what I do. 
He said, you know, what, that's re- you know what you just showed is repentance and faith. You said, I can't keep going the direction I'm going. I've got to abandon ship, and I can't save myself. I'm going to the parachute, which has a promise that it'll bring me to life. And Jesus Christ, if you will, is that deliverer. He's not a parachute. He's so much greater, but he is our Savior. And so we see our lives are headed for destruction, and we can't save ourselves. And so we turn to Jesus, Lord, save me, rescue me, and and he is our Savior. But there's repentance and faith. Uh, If you repent without faith, you're still destroyed, right? What if you say, I have faith, but you don't leave the plane? You put on the parachute, and you pull the cord, and you're still inside. What's that going to do for you? Nothing. You've got to repent and believe in order to have life, and so it is with the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to turn from trusting yourself and see Him as the answer and put your faith and trust in Him to bring you to life. But as we go to verses 22 down to verse number 24, the Apostle Paul now begins to speak about what lies ahead. And interestingly, what lied ahead for him was something he had certain... I guess you could say uh, he had a feeling. He had a feeling that when he went to Jerusalem that he was going to be bound. In fact, he even says in verse number 22, he says, Now behold, I go bound in the Spirit. Interesting that he would use that phrase. Before he ever gets to Jerusalem, the Apostle Paul is going to be told by a prophet that he's going to be in, he'll, he's going to be in chains if he goes to Jerusalem. So not only would he be bound in the Spirit, but he is going to be bound physically by the Romans as well. So here Paul has, if you will, a future glimpse of what's going to happen to his life. What if you could see the future? What if you could see your personal future? There's a lot of people who hope to get a glimpse of that. Uh, There have been many that go to psychics and people that go to uh, the, uh, the witch doctor and, and whoever else in different cultures they might find. But people are always hoping to find someone to tell them their future. Obviously, a child of God should not get involved in such things. It's demonic influence and witchcraft that's involved in a lot of that. But the second thing is, I don't know about, I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd want to know the future. You know, if I found out that uh, I will, um, what my future is, uh, some of it might scare or depress me, you know? Like, oh, no. And then, and then you lose the, the, the privilege and the opportunities of the present because you're dreading what lies, what lies on the horizon. Or, on the flip side of that, what if you found out, I'm going to live to be 100, and I'm going to be healthy the whole way through. You know what? There'd be another temptation, Right? That is, you squander your time. It's interesting, in Scripture, there was a man, Hezekiah, who found out that he was going to live another 15 years, right? He knew how much time he had. How did it go for him after finding that out? Not too good, right? In fact, his life before that point was much more devoted to the Lord, was very godly, but then once his life was extended and he had the promise of longer life, he started to fall away. He committed his his, his error in bringing in the Babylonians and letting them see all the treasures of the temple in knowing the future. We look into the Apostle Peter's life. He was told his future. If you read about it, John 21, Jesus spoke to him and to all the disciples, and he told them, he told Peter directly, the fate that would befall him, the manner of death that he would die. He told him, you will die a martyr's death. You will be led by others, and you will not have control over where they're leading you. In other words, you'll be in bondage. You will be suffering a martyr's death. And even in that, the Lord told Peter, feed my sheep. Now, what if the Lord told you that was your future? And then he said, now come follow me. Come follow me to persecution. Come follow me to pain. Come follow me to martyr's death. Would you go? Pretty amazing that Peter did, isn't it? Having that knowledge, and yet he went out with such fervor and such zeal. By the way, that was the power of meeting with the resurrected Lord. 
when you know the resurrected Lord and you know that you'll live forever, what is this life? What is this life? And he decided he wasn't going to squander it living for himself. He was going to spend it all for the cause of Christ. And praise God that he did. Paul here in this passage knows his personal future. He could see what was on the horizon was not necessarily desirable in the flesh. But he was bound in the spirit. And you'll notice what he says again in verse 24. He says, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. In other words, they're not taking me off course. Doesn't matter. I'm still going to Jerusalem. I'm still following the Lord. I'm still going to be going where the Spirit leads me. These things aren't going to move me off course. None of these things move me. Now, again, we notice in this passage in verse 22, what were those things that he speaks of when he says, None of these things move me? If you look back just a couple of verses, verse 22, he says, He's being bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. The first thing that could move him is uncertainty. I don't know about you, but I like to have things planned out. I don't like uncertainty, right? There's things that, you know, I, I, there's so much uncertainty with our nation. <laughs> What's going to be happening a year from now? I don't know. I don't even like to think about it, right? I do know the Lord's in control of that. But in my own life, I don't like uncertainty. I want to know. This is what's going to happen, and, and then this is going to take place, and, and then this is going to be on the other side. I don't like uncertainty. I like going into a situation and not having, okay, we've got plan A, and if that doesn't work, then I've got plan B, and, and if that doesn't work, then I've got plan C, right? You're going through all these different possibilities. Well, Paul, he said, I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't have a plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. I'm just going. Uncertainty. It doesn't move him, he says. Not only that, in verse 23, he says, What I do know, that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. In other words, they're coming. I know this for a fact. I'm not sure exactly how it's going to go down, but I can guarantee I'm going to be persecuted. I can guarantee I'm going to be incarcerated. I've spent time in jails already. I know it's coming again. And he said, that's what's ahead. Suffering. Suffering lies ahead. And yet he says, doesn't move me. Huh. Suffering doesn't move me. And then if you go on in chapter 21, you'll see in verses 11 to 14 that not only would these things not move him, but neither would people urging him to change course. If you look at verse 11, the Bible tells us when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle, this is Agabus, a prophet, and bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we heard these things, Luke here, both we and they of that place, besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. And so here you've got not only Paul's knowledge of the suffering that lies ahead, uncertainty of how it's all going to come about, but now you've got people saying, Paul, don't go. Paul, don't go. And, and you can imagine, it says in verse 12, they besought him. I don't think it was just as simple as Paul, don't go. I think there were people pleading with him. And you can imagine some in that group perhaps even crying, Don't do this. Change course. But Paul answered in verse 13, What mean ye to weep and to break my heart? For I am ready not not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, that wasn't the Lord's plan. He wasn't going to die in Jerusalem. But we're just going back to that thought again in verse 24. None of these things move me. Question, do these things move us? Does uncertainty move us? And when I say does it move us, I mean, does it move us from faith to fear when there's uncertainty? Do we go from being convinced to doubting through uncertainty? Does it move us from a place of peace to worry? 
Does uncertainty move us from the blessed life that the Lord has for us? But we're going to see on Sunday morning in Romans 15 how that there's joy and peace in believing. But oftentimes uncertainty steals that joy and peace. It's not really the uncertainty that does it. It's our lack of faith that causes us to lose the joy and the peace that God has for us. But here it wouldn't move Paul. Does it move us? Does suffering move us? Does suffering move us from joy in the Lord and trusting in Him? Now, Paul knew the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Uh, someone has pointed out, and I, I believe it true, suffering will either force us closer to Christ or will push us further from Christ. Suffering is always going to apply pressure, and it can push me to the Lord, or I can allow it to push me from the Lord. What's suffering going to do? Is it going to move us from Him? I think that while we look at these things that would not move Paul, we can look into Scripture and we can find things that moved others beyond suffering or uncertainty. We find Ananias and Sapphira. They were moved by what? Self-seeking. They wanted the praise of men. They were on course. They were in that church. They were with the disciples. They were in fellowship. But what God offered was not enough. They wanted some what the world had too. They wanted their names up in the lights. They wanted that praise of men. And they were moved when they thought that was possible. Paul spoke of another one of his disciples named Demas. He said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Moved off course by what the world offers. Its pleasures, its possessions, its pride. It moved him. He believed its lies and he went away. Peter was carried away by the moment when he was questioned. He was moved. You know, all of us have an adversary who tries to get us to move off the path that we're on, tries to get us to, to fall away, move aside. Oh, that we would be steadfast, unmovable. Those are the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be steadfast. Don't be moved. You know, the context of 1 Corinthians 15 is what? It's the resurrection. Why be steadfast? Because He lives. And because He lives, I too will rise again. I can be steadfast because this life is not forever and this life is just the beginning. And the best life is not now. The best life is yet to come. So I can be steadfast because eternity awaits. So the resurrection changes everything in that regard. But you'll notice also in this passage, verse 24, the next phrase that he spoke. How could he say that none of these things move me? Well, here's the, here's the reason why. He says, neither count I my life dear unto myself. That's why he wasn't moved. Because his own life wasn't what he was trying to save. You remember the words of Jesus. I know you're familiar with it. Jesus said, Whoso will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake in the gospel, the same shall find it. In other words, you, you squander your life when you try to save it for yourself. You spend it wisely and actually gain life. Use it well when you use it for Christ's sake. This phrase that he speaks in, verse number 24, neither count I my life dear unto myself, I believe is, is tied up in that same thought of Philippians 1.21. And I just love the simplicity of that verse and yet the depth of that verse. Uh, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Uh, there's just so much there and it's such a... Uh, 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 I don't know if I would say the pivotal verse, but, but just a centering verse. Easy, oftentimes in our Christian life, it's easy to get off course, and we just have to come back to, no, for to me to live is Christ. My life is Christ. I am hid with Christ. Um, 
I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. It's all about Christ. And so that's why he could say, I don't count my life dear unto myself, I already died. The life that I now live, it's Christ. It's Christ. I already gave my life away. I've given it to Him. Being bound in the Spirit doesn't trouble me. That's what I want. I want Him to lead me. It's His life. It's His body. And I'll go where He leads me to go. Now, if we're able to make such a statement and live out such a life, I think there's a few things implied. One is faith. Certainly, there must be faith. The life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I think there's a second part to that, and that is love. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Uh, neither count of my life dear to myself, it's His. It's love. Just as Christ gave Himself for us, that was love. And so when I give myself for Him, it's a sacrifice of love. And so there's love at the root of it. But there's also this key element as well in the Christian and the believer's life, and that is surrender. There's that big element of surrender. I'm just I've given it all over to the Lord. It's His. I don't resist. I don't fight. My life is not my own. Yield myself fully to Christ that whatever He may ask me to do, wherever He may ask me to go, anything that He wants me to be, I'll do it, I'll go, I'll be just that. Full surrender. It's a vital truth. Until we get to a place of full surrender, then we can't experience the fullness of God's blessing and we won't be where the Apostle Paul was at the end of this verse. In Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. And there, he says, he behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. The, the potter was at work, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. And there's a key phrase, as seemed good to the potter to make it. The clay is just at the disposal of the potter. Whatever the potter thought was good, that's where the clay went. That's the way the clay was fashioned. That's the way it was formed. And so it has to be in our lives. Full surrender. We sing the song, right? Have thine own way, Lord. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. What does it take to be clay in the hands of God? To be moldable clay. It takes that full surrender. Now, I've shared a story before, but it just still stands out to me. It's, it's so interesting. One of the most fascinating stories in history to me was a Japanese soldier, a soldier who after the war was over and it ended in 1945, continued fighting till 1975. 30 years he was fighting on. The war was over. The Japanese had surrendered, but he wouldn't. I remember reading about the story how they would send out different ones to try to convince him to give up. It's amazing, by the way, that he was able to survive on his own in the jungle. This is the Philippines is where he was. And he started off, there were three of them, I think, if I remember right, and the other two companions he had through the years had died. And I think about the last 10 or 15 years, he was all by himself. And, and they felt for this guy. They weren't trying to kill him. They're like, somebody's got to convince him, and nobody could. They'd send pamphlets. They'd drop pamphlets down and, and things like that where he could read and try to prove to him that they surrendered. He's like, no, it's all just mind games the Americans are playing. Until finally they had this idea that they went and they found one of his officers. And so an officer, a commanding officer, actually flew in from Japan and they took him out into the jungles and they found him with this commanding officer. And he finally convinced him to turn in his weapons. And so after all of that, the man was emaciated. He was still carrying his samurai sword. He was still wearing the same uniform, all tattered and torn after 30 years. So they asked him afterwards, how'd you feel? You know what he said? I felt like a fool. 
what have I been doing all those years? There's a lot of people that won't surrender to God. A lot of people that fight against the will of God, fight against Christ. Sometimes it's longer than 30 years, but the end is always the same. When you fight against Him, in the end you feel like a fool. Spiritually, you'll be emaciated. All of your life in tatters and ruins. When God wanted you to be free, when God wanted you to be full of blessing, serving Him, not living out in the spiritual jungle. It's interesting with the Civil War when it came to surrender. One of the most familiar ones is Ulysses S. Grant. He, of course, uh, had those first two letters, U.S., uh, that uh, they gave him a new nickname with those. Instead of Ulysses, uh, after an early battle where a Confederate general at a fort had asked him, what are the terms of surrender? And Grant responded, he said, no terms, unconditional surrender. So they called him unconditional surrender, Grant. And he got his unconditional surrender. But it's interesting, at the conclusion of the war, when Lee surrendered at Appomattox, that the way that Grant responded was quite unusual. Knowing that the war was over and victory was his, he showed kindness and respect toward the general of the Confederates. He allowed Robert E. Lee to ride freely in and out of the area. He allowed the Confederate men to keep their possessions and horses. He gave them food because they were hungry, and he let them all go home undisturbed. He didn't treat them like enemies. He treated them as though they were citizens of the nation again. Interesting, people are afraid to surrender to God. And yet when they surrender to Christ, what they receive is so much more freedom than what Grant gave to Lee. The freedom that we have in Christ only comes through surrender. Notice in this passage in verse 24, Paul was steadfast, Paul was surrendered. And because of that, Paul's life was a success. He says, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He said, this is my, this is my goal. I want to be faithful. I want to be able to finish my course with joy. I don't want to get to the end of the race with regret, with sorrow. He said, I want to run and I want to finish with joy. And so he had this vision of the end of the race. And, and that's, that's where we've got to go. I want to be there and I want to have run well. Not to please men, but to please the only one that matters, to please the Lord. I want to be able to finish my course with joy. Of course, very familiar words to what he said in 2 Timothy as he did get to the end of the race, right? 2 Timothy chapter number 4, where he said what? I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. And henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. How did he get there? It's what he said at the start of the verse. None of these things move me. He was steadfast. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. He was surrendered. And only then would he be able to be successful in the ministry and the course that God set before him. And so it is for us tonight. As we look at this verse, we consider these truths. What is there that moves you? I think sometimes we could even make it more practical and just say in our daily life. You know, we break it down to the day by day. What is it that moves us and knocks us off course? Is it some, something that the world does? Is it something that we listen to? Is it something that we hear? And, and all of a sudden we're just, we're in that wrong frame of mind again. It shakes us from our purpose. It shakes us from where we want to be by the end of the day. What is it that knocks us off course? Maybe sometimes it's self-inflicted things. Maybe there's things we need to turn off and stop listening to. People we need to stop being with. What is it that knocks us off course? What moves us away 
from where we ought to be. We've got to evaluate. And just then, not only in the small, in the everyday practical, but in the broad view, are we on course? Is our life on target? I think we need that question from time to time so we can get our bearings and make sure that, again, to me to live is Christ, to die is gain, not just that I've got it here, but that it's here and in my walk. And then again, the question, are we surrendered? Are there things that we're fighting and resisting that God tells us to do? Uh, there, there's so many ways that that can, it can be that way. Sometimes it's something we hold on to. We, we just won't fully trust God in a thing. We'll trust God in, in all these areas, but there's this, I just can't trust Him there. Or, or maybe it's something that He's called us to. You say, well, I, 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 I'll do this and I'll do that, but I, I'm not ready for that. God, in time, when I'm ready, then... I'll take that step of faith. Ah, surrender today. Otherwise, it might be 30 years down the, the road, and you look back and you say, I've been a fool. Missing out on the blessings and the freedom that comes in full surrender to Jesus Christ. Oh, for us to be able to say that we finished our course with joy. That we sprinted across that finish line. We gave our all in the race. Truly, that's a desire I'm sure of all of our hearts, steadfastness, full surrender may be a part of our lives. Let's pray. Father, I come to you tonight. I thank you for the privilege of being together and just ask your blessing on the word and use it in our lives. Father, may we be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord. And Father, may we be fully surrendered. Uh, Lord, may we not resist you in any way. May it be that daily we die to self and take up our cross and follow you. Help us tonight uh, that we might live steadfast and surrendered, that we might be a success, not, not for us by any means, but, Father, for you and for your glory, that we could finish the course that you set before us with joy. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, take out your prayer bulletins tonight, and um, I am going to have you all move around a little bit again and uh, get into some smaller groups for prayer time here in just a little bit. So keep that in mind. If you want to start your migration now, uh, then uh, you are welcome to do so. Um, but as you do, anybody have a praise, something that you want to thank the Lord for and praise Him for? Chloe. All right, we'll pray for your sister and for this job need that she has. But who has a praise? Jan. My 93 year old brother came back to the Lord this week. Amen. 93 year old brother in right with God. Amen. Yes, Cindy. I want to praise the, everybody at this church for the prayers for my last illness. It was very, very short lived. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God for healing. And for people to pray for you. Amen. Who else? Any other praises? I have an unspoken praise, just, uh, and, and just related to just God's goodness. Just God's good. Sometimes it just in His goodness, He leaves you speechless. Do you ever feel that way? It's a, who am I? Right? Who am I that you would show such goodness and kindness and love to me? So praise God for that. All right, well, in your prayer bulletins, remember those praises. We want to make sure that we give thanks to God. Uh, we certainly want to be praying for our purpose um, on the teen retreat. Uh, do pray for them. Uh, again, tonight is, uh, today is the, kind of the midway point. Two full more days uh, left there in Georgia, and then they travel back on Saturday. So pray for all of that, and pray the Lord just use the, the time and the Word, uh, the time apart. Uh, again, it's wonderful. All the distractions of electronics and television and all those things are away uh, just a week. Uh, and of course, in our teen group um, here recently, so many from camp uh, profess faith in Christ. So pray for growth there in them as well and uh, them following the Lord. So uh, pray for the teen retreat. I uh, want to pray for that, especially here this evening. And then pray also for these other 
uh, meetings as well, the men's breakfast, the men's Bible study. Pray for the food pantry, the Lord's blessing there, um, just in uh, opening doors to us. Pray the Lord will open doors through it, uh, ministry and, and sharing the gospel. Thankful for the ladies that uh, volunteer their time and get involved with it. And remember the Sunshine Club also, that ministry of encouragement. Pray for the Fernandez, uh, our missionaries to Alaska. And uh, right now, there are uh, uh, a lot of different moving parts, and just the Lord would keep them just in the right way and uh, doing and, and abiding in His will and, and guiding them each step of the way. Uh, remember the Paytons, uh, our missionaries to Spanish nations. He does a lot through uh, aircraft and, and ministry, so he'll fly in and meet with uh, different groups and different meetings. And um, so... Um, He's asking prayer for four, or praising the Lord for four that recently had professed faith in Christ. Uh, and then also pray for their passports renewal. And uh, they're still waiting on an aircraft to arrive that they will also be using. Remember the Figalis. Uh, recently they had a conference in the Middle East. 50 professed Christ and 47 followed Him in baptism. And so that's an exciting thing to see, of course, in that society. To take the step of public baptism uh, can, for, can, for many of them, be a, a death sentence. So uh, just pray for these believers. Can you imagine living in that? I mean, you, we read what Paul said, and uh, it's true of them. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. None of these things move me. And they're saying that by being baptized. I think that's, that's really awesome to see. But pray for them and pray for their being sustained. And then also just for freedom. Right? We, we take religious freedom for granted. Um, maybe not so much as we used to because we could see storm clouds on the horizon in that regard, but uh, pray these people might know that freedom and, and have the freedom to worship and serve the Lord. Pray for the spiritual needs about us. Um, one that I added to the list this week is Guy Wheel. Um, he, I know he shared with some of you what he's going through. He's moved up to New York, uh, but just pray for him, uh, the Lord, to work in Guy's life. Um, these all, others also on our list, some of these have been here for quite a while, um, but uh, we want to pray for them. And uh, these, some of these are loved ones, friends. Um, does anybody have any they'd like to add tonight specifically for spiritual needs? All right. Remember Kathy and Rose? Yes, Tommy. I'll just put Richard because I, I couldn't quite make out that last name. But what the Lord knows, Richard. So let's pray for Richard's salvation. Chloe. Charlie. All right. Remember Charlie. I had asked you to pray for a man named Maurice Walters who was on hospice, uh, dying of cancer. He did pass away. And that is a praise. Uh, that was his request that the Lord would just let me go home. But now I'll be doing his funeral services. And uh, my understanding from what I could gather from him is children are either unsaved or not walking with the Lord. Um, I may be wrong on that. I'll find out. But um, pray for the family and the funeral that's coming up here on Monday. Um, so pray for Maurice's family. And uh, he asked me, of course, and I'm always glad to be able, when I can get up in front of people and say, look, I'm preaching what he wanted me to preach. This is what he asked me to preach. And not only that, it's what the Lord asked me to preach. So, you know, don't blame me for what I'm about to say. <laughs> uh, no, pray, pray for grace in that meeting. That'll be Monday. It's a funeral. And Maurice's friends and family that will be here for that. All right? So remember Maurice's family. Marsha. Pray for Thurman Williams as well. Mike. There's a lady in the nursing home ministry today in the second one. Her name is Pat. Um, I think she's Catholic. Um, but she, she, she came today. She sat through the whole thing. And she was very, and I, I, I watched her a couple times as the message was proceeding. And, and she was engaging. Donna spoke with her and a couple of the other ladies afterwards. And um, she'll be back next week. And, and so uh, we have a, I have one other Catholic. Outside, I spoke with her a couple of days now, and she doesn't want anything to 
to do with it. Uh, but I changed the tempo and I changed it. I'm talking talk about the weather, with her, and thing. And it, it, it smooths out. But just pray that the Lord will soften her heart and allow me to say the right things to her and bring her. And Amen. Pray for these ones that are at the uh, assisted living places, the one over here um, uh, on the other side of uh, 41 and the one up here on the corner of Price and Sumter. And uh, these that uh, Mike and some of the ladies and others are reaching out to here week by week. So pray in particular for Pat, a Catholic lady that uh, was in their service here today. John. Uh, I'll spell it for you. It's Noime, N-O-I-M-E, and Vinny. She's Filipino, the husband and wife, and uh, they need salvation. All right. Pray for Noime. Is that what you said? Noime? Noime. Noime. All right, you annoy me. That's kind of how it sounds, right? <laughs> annoy me. You don't say that. All right. You annoy me, right? No, it's just, anyway. Um, all right. I annoy them. You annoy them. They yes. They my eggs, and I get to witness them over and over and over, and it's just stuck on the Catholicism. All right, let's pray for this couple that uh, John's had a chance to witness to, and pray for them, Noime and her husband. All right, pray for the sick and needy. Um, Svetlana Pushkash has been attending our services. Uh, she has prayer. She is traveling to Ukraine today. Um, all of her family is over there. Um, I think she was sharing with me a couple weeks ago when she made this request to us to pray for her travels. Um, but brother, father, I think, are both there, are not allowed to leave the country. Uh, because of the war, they want all the men to stay, of course, and fight. I said, how old is your father? 63. And they won't let him go? No, they won't let him go. And so she's going over into Ukraine to visit with the family. And uh, so pray for her safety, pray for her family here. I baptized her son Sasha uh, back in April or May. And uh, so this is Svetlana. She's now, I assume everything went according to plan. She's in Ukraine here today. Uh, thanks for praying for me. I'm getting better or worse, depends on which uh, side of the uh, aisle you're on with that. Uh, found out both my uncles had the exact same surgery when they were in their 20s. Uh, so I look at all my kids and I say, sorry guys, uh, apparently this is genetic. <laughs> so uh, it was interesting when I'd gone to the surgeon beforehand, they said normally this uh, issue that you have manifests uh, and has to be taken care of in guys when they're uh, late teens, early 20s, or else as seniors. And I'm like, mid 40s, I don't I hope I haven't gone to the advanced, you know, physical age of being a senior at this point, you know. But anyway, that's uh, interesting. My uncles both had it in their early 20s. So uh, but I found that fascinating. My dad shared that with me on uh, Sunday. I thought, oh, wow, okay, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, but uh, anyway, thanks for praying for me. Things are progressing in a good way that way. Um, pray for Robin. And... Um, recovering and also if somebody has and the need was mentioned to me that if she has a uh, a really good walker where she can actually kneel on it right and so she can ride like a scooter kind of like a kneeling scooter then she may be able to come home after only three weeks so if anybody has one of those if anyone can build one of those if anybody can steal no i'm kidding um uh, <laughs> If you know of one um, and can you know, just loan it to her while she recovers, then um, I know that would be a blessing to her. So keep that in mind for Robin. Um, serious prayer request tonight. I don't know if some of you maybe got the prayer chain request. Judy Ludos was taken to the emergency room. Um, I think about a year ago she had um, just they discovered her platelet count was really low, got all the way down to two, and uh, happened again today. Um, so platelets all the way down to two. Uh, I believe that uh, she had just been previously with the doctor and her count was at 150. So why all of a sudden it just dropped off um, if, if uh, the doctor, of course, very serious doctor is sharing with Phil and Phil texted me that, you know, if like, for instance, she started a brain bleed, there'd be nothing they could do for her. No way of stopping, no, because the platelets are so low. So um, very serious that um, she's just, I'm sure, going to be in the hospital for a while and uh, watched over. So pray for her, pray for Phil, and the uh, Lord just to cause this. And, and, and I don't think they've, uh, I was talking with um, um, Jim and Sarah beforehand, and 
I don't, I don't think they ever found out why this happened a year ago, and, and so, you know, now it's happened again, so pray for her, and uh, pray for the doctors right now, and pray they can get to the bottom of this, what's, what's causing this, uh, but pray right now for the Lord to work in her body. And um, any others with an update, or, uh, you know, I saw Bud Steele on Sunday, he said he's doing well, I asked if he was staying out of trouble, he said no, so it sounds like he's, you know, doing well, and... Um, uh, we just pray for him, battling mesothelioma. Um, his numbers have been good, and um, so far all answers to prayer in that regard. So uh, just pray for Bud. Anybody else? Marsha? Nancy goes to the oncologist on August the 11th uh, to find out what stage and how aggressive the cancer is. They, so just pray that they'll get good news. All right. So let's pray for this oncologist visit for Nancy in a uh, week from tomorrow. Valia? Uh, my sister Nyla is going in for surgery on Friday for her for bleeding behind her left eye. All right, let's pray for Valia's sister with this surgery on her left eye. Tommy? Pray for Rich and financial needs. Kathy? All right, for Kathy, it's unspoken. All right, well, pray for our nation. Certainly want to be praying for those uh, in Kentucky um, and um, all the devastation that they faced. Uh, be praying for, boy, I sure was disappointed with Kansas. I don't know about you. And... Um, you know, the people, 59% voting to um, hold on to abortion, and that's in a more conservative state. And I just think to myself, boy, you know, Jesus said it'd be better to wrap a millstone around your neck and be cast in the sea than to offend a little one. And here is a nation, boy, how many millstones are we wrapping around our necks? Um, so pray, you know, I, I just, are, are these people blind? I, in my lifetime, I, I'm sure probably most of you, I don't know if all of you have or not, have you, have you ever seen, uh, I'm sure you probably have, an aborted baby? I've seen not only an aborted baby, uh, aborted is the nice word, a murdered baby, I've seen um, put into just video graphics what happens in an abortion and some of the procedures they carry out. And I'll tell you, when I, when I see something like that, man, it shakes you. I just wonder, are these people that are voting for this, have they seen this? Have they witnessed the, the horrific? You know, they took, um, in Germany, after the Holocaust, they took a lot of the citizens there into those camps, and they made them walk through. And I, I remember watching video of the people going in and then the video of the people coming out. And they were just, you know, they didn't really think about it. It didn't really make any impact on them. But after they got in there and they saw it firsthand, they came out. You should have seen them holding their faces. You should have seen them after what they saw that was going on under their noses not nearly for as long as abortion's been happening here. And these people vote for this. And these people want this. And you see people fired up. Say, we're going to get a big turnout in the election so we can keep killing these babies. Well, I'll tell you what, it makes me mad. Uh, it's sad. America is in big trouble. Big, big trouble. Big trouble with God. Pray for our America. Pray for our nation. Find somebody with you can pray with here. Pray for these things here tonight. Find somebody close by you can pray with, maybe a group of two or three or four. And um, take these things to the Lord, even as we go on a brighter note. Uh, who's got some prayer promises? Yes. Prayer today was a, uh, well, the 
Lord will never leave you or forsake you. He will never leave us or forsake us. And pray for the people of Taiwan, what they're facing, very similar to Ukraine and, you know. And I'm, in a way, I'm glad she went. In a way, I'm glad, you know, you got to stand up to China, and I think too long we haven't. And um, so, but yeah, pray for, pray for the uh, people there, pray for the world. It's only going to get worse. One of these days, the trigger's going to get pulled. One of these days, the button's going to get pushed. One of these days... War like this world's never seen is going to happen. World War II is not going to be anything compared to World War III. Gog and Magog. All the war breaks out. Armageddon. It's coming. I believe it's real close. Trumpet's even closer. Pray even so come Lord Jesus. But who's got a prayer promise? Marcia. Amen. Veils very much. Anybody else? I like Romans eight twenty six as well. Likewise, also the Spirit beareth, interse- makes intercession for us, right, with which, with groanings which cannot be uttered. Um, he knows our infirmities. We we don't know how to pray as we ought. The verse says, but uh, he does. And so even here tonight in these things, sometimes you just go and you just... Have you ever just found yourself just sighing in prayer? <laughs> I don't even know what to say, Lord. I don't even know what to say. But the Spirit does. And He takes those things to that throne of grace. Praise God for that. Well, let's go to prayer here tonight. And um, you pray right there with some folks around you. And then I'll close with some prayer here in just a little bit. <clears throat>
requests that have been lifted up tonight or anything for thee. We thank you for your power. We thank you, Father, for your goodness. And Lord, it's, it's not that you don't have the power to answer prayer. It's not that you don't care. Lord, you do care. You do love. You are good. You are all-powerful. And so we just lift these things to you tonight, and we trust you, thanking you that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It's an amazing promise you've made to us. Help us to claim it, believe it, and live it. Lord, I thank tonight of Judy and Phil. Um, Lord, watch over her uh, while she's in this very dangerous spot uh, with her blood, with her platelet counts. And um, Lord, I pray that uh, you'd help the, the doctors there restore uh, her platelet count to where it needs to be. And, and then, Lord, that you'd just open their eyes to what's causing this. Again, we thank you, Father, for watching over her and, uh, Lord, getting her to the hospital safely. I, I just pray for peace to her and to Phil. Um, Lord, also tonight, we, Lord, we do pray for our nation. Lord, things like today in Kansas, these, these things are heartbreaking, heart-wrenching as we consider a nation that just continues down a path of self-destruction, revealing uh, we don't worship you at all. We've turned our backs on you, Father. You shed your grace on us, but we've, we in our pride have, have turned away from you. Lord, turn us back again. Bring a revival. Bring it to your churches. Uh, Lord, bring an awakening to this nation. May we fear you, and may our leaders be saved. May the lowest be saved. I pray, Father, for this land. I pray for healing to the people of Kentucky. Lord, cross this nation, ones who are suffering. Uh, may they look to you. May you use these things as a, as a time, Lord, just to draw people to yourself. And Lord, we pray tonight, even so come, Lord Jesus. We know that the, the return of the Lord draws nigh. And uh, Lord, help us to live in light of it. Help us to live expectantly and joyfully, uh, knowing the future that awaits us. So, Lord, may we be steadfast tonight. May we be steadfast tomorrow. May we be abounding in the work of the Lord and uh, be preparing for that day and preparing others as well. Be with us as we go tonight. Uh, Lord, may we go uh, walking in the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here tonight. Hope that you have a great remainder of the week. And um, I should have mentioned, be praying for one Steve Anthony as well. should have mentioned he's got heart issues, and I failed to mention him. So pray for Steve tonight also, if you would. But you are dismissed. Thank you for coming.